is question number 2606 on Londoners at risk of eviction during coronavirus in the name of Assembly Member Barry. Assembly Member Barry, your question, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm deeply concerned that a quarter of London's 2.2 million privately renting adults have uh, fallen behind on their rent during the pandemic or say they're likely to do so soon, meaning half a million people are potentially facing eviction in our city. That's why I've written to the Secretary of State calling on the government to give me the powers to freeze private rents in London for two years as an emergency measure to protect renters while the extent of the economic crisis becomes clear. During this time, rents would be allowed to fall but not rise. To support this, I'm asking the government for a wider package of support for renters. First, grants to allow renters to stay in their homes and clear arrears until the government can make changes to welfare that will support everyone to sustain their tenancies in the longer term. Second, expanding access to welfare, including scrapping the benefit cap, uprating local housing allowance to median market rents, additional discretionary housing payments to cover shortfalls and extending eligibility to all renters, including those not currently entitled. Third, scrapping Section 21 no-fault eviction as soon as possible and restricting access to Section 8 eviction until the wider welfare measures outlined uh, are brought in. Throughout the pandemic, I've lobbied the government to use the time afforded by the eviction ban to put in place measures to support renters. It squandered this time, I'm afraid, and is actually withdrawing support by bringing the furlough scheme to an end. The government's new six-month notice period and the one-month extension of the eviction ban will protect renters from homelessness for a little longer. However, with no further support to help renters stay in their homes, many will simply accrue more and more debt with no means of paying it off. I've used my own limited powers and resources to provide information and guidance to renters and landlords on the City Hall website and paid for hundreds of local government officers and almost 1,500 Met Police officers to be trained in combating illegal evictions and supporting renters. In the longer term, the cost to the state of a tsunami of evictions will far outweigh those of putting in place the preventative measures I've outlined, especially if we're given the powers to bring private rents under control. The government must face the reality that now is not the time to turn off the taps. Thank you for laying all that out, Mr Mayor, um, and the way you've responded to this question coming up today and the campaigners with your statements yesterday. It's all sorely needed. And looking back, it's notable to see you've come on such a journey on renting rights since we first started pushing you. Um, now, the last time we spoke about this in May, I was really focused on the arrears that were building up and getting these forgiven, and it was unclear then whether you had proposals for that. But in your statement yesterday and just now, you've mentioned that you want to see grants to allow renters to stay in their homes and clear arrears. Um, this is good, but can I just ask, this is the rent forgiveness we're talking about. You, you wouldn't be expecting those renters to pay this back if it well, was a grant. What I'm hoping is that the government looks at the... Uh, suggestions I've made, one of which is grants to help not just with future rent but arrears that are built up because the accrued rent arrears could lead to grants for a Section 8 uh, eviction. So you'll have seen a package of measures, uh, I'm happy to share the letter with you, that I've asked the government to uh, include in a package of support. And as you're aware, Sean, we're talking about potentially 500,000 Londoners at the moment mm. at risk of potential eviction from September 22nd onwards. No, I think, I think that's right. I mean, the fairest thing, the renters themselves need to have their debts cleared. It's a significant investment we're asking for, but it would be worth it. And this is all progress. I, I thank you for that, and I hope the government listens. Um, now, unemployment is affecting many renters, particularly young people. The new employment figures are extremely worrying. We've all commented on them. And the crisis is prompting more and more people to consider the idea of an unconditional basic support system without cracks for people to fall through. So have you yourself come round to the idea of a universal basic income yet? I've already said it's a, an, an issue worth exploring. Uh, the evidence is mixed, or actually not good, in the country where they, they piloted uh, this. But uh, you'll, you'll know that some people are, uh, are equating a furlough scheme with a sort of inverted commas universal basic uh, income. I think it's worth exploring. Uh, you know, I'm not fully signed up to introduce the universal basic income, but I think it's worth exploring the idea. Um, I'm particularly conscious, not, not just so much of the universal basic income with the furlough scheme, but actually that a, a number of women in London and across the country do a number of work at home, whether it's childcare or other issues, and aren't remunerated for doing so. And you and I both know women whose careers haven't progressed because of additional responsibilities they're not paid for, and often when they're older, 
uh, that I've got the same pension uh, as, as many men have. So I think there's a whole piece of work required to look at unfairness in the workplace. Great. I will, I will explore that further with you in future questions. And please do look at the final results of the finished study. Thank you, Bart. My out of time. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Questions from Assemblymember Berry. Thank you, Chair. I'm a strong advocate of flexible working and actively promote it through the Good Work Standard. I led by example in encouraging flexible practices and increasing flexible working options across the GLA. The idea of a four-day working week can mean different things. For example, some colleagues here at the GLA work compressed hours, fitting in their full working hours over four days, one of many flexible working options that I'm proud that the GLA offers to staff. I know that many campaigners are keen that we move to a 28-30 hour working week over four days. I think it's an interesting idea, especially in the context of our economic recovery from the pandemic. I think for many people, the way we work will change. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that people can still be productive, whether in the office or at home. Working flexible hours has also played an important role in enabling people to keep working. As long as social distancing rules are in place, there is a limit to how many people can safely return to workplaces and employers will need to continue to support a wide range of flexibilities. As I've said, flexible working can take many forms, but what's important is that it must bring benefits to both the employer and employee. I'm concerned that too often in the gig economy and zero hours contract, what we see is flexibility works for the employer, but doesn't offer security or a guaranteed income for the worker. We also need to continue support for Londoners who cannot work or on reduced hours because of the pandemic. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I have five seconds left to say thank you very much. Um, the public do support this uh, measure coming in, and I know that we as Greens have put forward some amendments to explore it in the GLA so we can be a leader on this, and I hope we can keep talking about a four-day week.